Sure. We will answer questions at the end of this meeting. So let's start with new capabilities for big data analytics in the cloud. Uh, Matt Winkler, our speaker today, is a program manager for HD Insight. So uh, Matt, you can start now. Hello. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, I do. Um, hold yeah. on a second, I'm gonna make you a presenter. So you are now a presenter. I will let you know when I see your screen. Okay. Great, uh, yes, I see PowerPoint presentation, big analytics in the cloud. So uh, okay. go ahead Great. and thank you very much for speaking at our Big Data Virtual Chapter. Great, uh, so I'd like to thank everyone for uh, for joining us this morning and uh, giving up an hour to learn a little bit about what we're doing inside of Azure uh, around big data. We had a large set of announcements last week uh, and we're really excited to be able to talk about uh, all of the fun stuff that we've been working on uh, over the last few years. My name is Matt Winkler. I'm a group program manager on the big data team here at Microsoft. The big data team is responsible for all of the big data platforms at Microsoft. And so that consists of our external uh, big data platforms that customers can leverage inside of the cloud. These are things like HD Insight as well as Azure Data Lake, which we'll talk about a whole lot more. And then also internally, uh, our team's responsible for running Cosmos, uh, which is a system uh, that I like to joke uh, is where Bing keeps its copies of the internet. Uh, and it really is the, the analytics platform that powers a lot of Microsoft internally. So we'll be talking about a couple of things today. Uh, I, I always like to ground these types of conversations based on what real customers are doing. Uh, and we've been incredibly fortunate in the big data business. Uh, it's one of the fastest growing uh, spaces in the cloud today. Uh, and so we've got a, a rich set of customer stories that we can talk about. Uh, and so I'll be talking about those today. And then uh, I'd like to introduce the Azure Data Lake, uh, which is the, the, the way that we talk about how to do big data in the cloud with Microsoft. And, that, and we'll dive into the announcements that we've made. And then really what I want to focus on, you know, the reason why we're doing a lot of this is that we're pretty focused at Microsoft on making our customers productive uh, and letting them focus on the problems that they want to solve and helping them solve those problems. And so what we'll finish up with is a tour through the various features and capabilities inside Azure Data Lake uh, that make uh, your life uh, and your customers' lives uh, a whole lot easier. Uh, we'll save questions for the end, um, and I'll, I can stick around a little bit to answer as many of those as come up. If you'd like to get in touch with me directly, uh, I've, my uh, email address is on the first slide. It's just mwinkle at microsoft.com. So there's three customer use cases that I'd like to talk about. Uh, this first one is about a company called Just Giving. Uh, and if you've ever logged on to Facebook and you've seen one of your friends or a friend of a friend is attempting to do some fundraising, uh, maybe they're going to you know, ride their bicycle across the state or they are, uh, you know, they're trying to raise money because one of the parents in uh, your children's uh, class at school uh, is is sick and needs a little bit of help. Um, you've probably seen those types of things inside of Facebook and Twitter. And Just Giving is one of the companies that powers those. They describe themselves as a uh, online social giving platform. And they were faced with this really interesting problem, which is uh, they've raised billions of dollars for all sorts of various causes. But what they found out is that their customers were very transactional, which is they would come in, they would contribute to the cause they came in for, and then they may never come back. Uh, and so what Just Giving wanted to do was they wanted to create a more engaging experience for their customers. And if you think about it, they're sitting on a really interesting pile of data. They've got a deep understanding of 
all of the various causes that people are donating to, whether that's the Humane Society or a uh, cancer research fund or a local church group, they understand a lot of those causes. They also understand when people give to those causes, and then they also understand a little bit about the people who give from the fact that a lot of times these things will get shared on Facebook or other social media. And so what they were able to start doing is put together something that they call the Give Graph, which is this massive graph of people and causes uh, and the interactions between them uh, that, that's just massive. It's in the hundreds of millions of nodes. Uh, and if anybody remembers, I don't know, maybe their sophomore year of computer science class, graph problems are hard. Uh, and then when they scale, they're very, very hard. And so what they're doing is they're using HD Insight in order to understand uh, how people are giving so that they can actually recommend uh, to their users, hey, I saw that you donated to this. We know that you're interested in dogs and that you probably live in this part of uh, Chicago. Did you know there's an animal shelter near you that's also running a campaign? And what they've been able to do is increase their customers' engagement uh, and increase the amount of giving that's happening. And so that's kind of a cool scenario where they've got this very interesting data sh set. It's shaped kind of funny. It's a big, giant graph. Uh, and they have to do some non-typical analysis on it, which is they want to build a set of recommendations. Um, and so they use HD Insight for that. The second, uh, the second use case that I'd like to talk about is a manufacturer of wind turbines. Um, and if you've ever seen uh, a, a wind farm, you know, these turbines are you know, the heart and soul of what transforms the wind into power. Uh, they're incredibly complex and incredibly expensive machines, uh, and they emit a ton of data. So I, I think the scenario we worked with with uh, this company was every 25 milliseconds, it emits 10 distinct data points, uh, and then every second, it emits 40 distinct data points. And if you think about that at the scale of a wind farm that has hundreds of wind turbines to this, then the scale of hundreds of wind farms uh, across America and Europe, that's a lot of data. And so these folks started off down a very interesting path, which was first, they just wanted to understand the system. They wanted to know what was happening, what are the most productive uh, placements of wind turbines. Uh, and so they started off doing kind of what I would describe as very basic, kind of straightforward data warehousing analytics, uh, trying to understand the past uh, and provide value in terms of, hey, help me understand what's really happening. They then started mixing together other interesting data sources, uh, such as their maintenance tickets, as well as their failure database. And they were actually able to start doing more advanced analytics. So they were using machine learning in order to determine, hey, what are the leading indicators of failure? And they started to move that from a retroactive system to something that was proactive. So in real time, looking at the events coming into the system and saying, hey, uh, we've now seen that turbine 72 has exceeded threshold X. Uh, we either need to shut that down or dispatch a field technician to fix it. And oftentimes we've seen with, with other uh, Internet of Things scenarios with this preventative maintenance, uh, a $4 part may be the thing that prevents a million dollar turbine or generator from failing. Uh, and so that's been incredibly value for, valuable for them. The final thing that's interesting about this case study is it actually allowed the company to create a new revenue source. And so what they started doing was providing to their customers. So their customers are the power companies that own the wind farms. And what they would provide to their customers is the, the raw data and the ability to analyze that data. And so they were actually able to create this new source of income for them by offering, hey, uh, here's the standard set of reports. And if you want to be able to party on this data by yourself, 
here's a way you can go write some SQL queries against that. Uh, and so I like this, this use case because it touches on dealing with massive scales of data, evolving from kind of the uh, analytics of today to the more advanced analytics scenarios, and also about this notion of a data economy uh, and being able to create a new uh, income source for the company. The final one uh, is a large federal tax agency. Uh, this is not the tax agency in the United States, um, but it's a, a similarly large country that if I said the name of, all of you would know. Um, they have a very interesting problem, which is they actually have the ability to collect uh, XML documents that describe every taxable transaction that occurred in the country. Uh, and they need to make sense out of that. And so what they were able to do is upload these documents into the cloud and then be able to begin processing those. And what they've been able to do is increase the detection rate for money laundering. They've been able to create a, a better verification when people submit their uh, taxes so that less people have audits uh, and more people that need audits have audits. Um, and what they've done as well is they've actually started backloading previous year's documents as well. So they're creating this massive data set that allows them to do this very, very interesting analysis. Um, at its peak, they were running over 1,200 nodes uh, of HD Insight clusters uh, in order to process all of this data and run the type of analytics that they wanted to be able to do. The other thing that they were able to do there is take this massive data set that's shaped very funny in these XML documents, refine it inside of HD Insight, and load the refined, distilled, very, very useful data into SQL Data Warehouse, uh, which allowed them to then take all of their typical tools like Excel or Tableau or Power BI or Click uh, and be able to use that uh, in order to run their analytics in, in real time because a lot of Hadoop uh, type jobs are very batch oriented. So those are three different uh, use cases, one across very uh, kind of funny shaped data in a graph, the second one about a whole lot of data coming from uh, sensors, and then the third one about being able to take this semi-structured dirty data uh, and actually make sense out of it and start doing some interesting uh, analytics on top of it. And so we've worked, we've been working with customers running big data workloads in the cloud for a number of years now. I've been on the team here for uh, four or five years uh, working with Hadoop and more lately working with Data Lake, you know, and really what we're looking to do is make big data easy. Uh, we know that big data poses a lot of challenges, uh, whether it's hey, just what is the, the technology that I need to be able to use to process this many XML documents? Uh, we want you to be able to process data. We, we want you to be able to do processing on any data of any size. A second problem that we've realized is the tools to do big data today are very, very hard. Uh, it's hard to get started. Uh, it's hard to become super productive with them. There's steep learning curves. We really want to make our customers productive on day one, uh, whether they're a developer or an analyst uh, or uh, someone coming uh, more of a data engineer. We want all of those folks to be able to be productive. Uh, and we want that productivity to be maintained as they grow in their skills. Um, you know, a lot of times there are tools that make it very easy to get started, but then when you start to get very advanced, they start to fall over. Uh, and it becomes much more difficult to you know, tune a job that's running across a thousand nodes. And so this is something we, we're very excited about being able to, to bring into the market. The final thing that we hear from a lot of customers is, hey, uh, I like all this big data stuff, but I need to sell my central IT department on this. I need to sell my chief security officer on this. Uh, and the there's a challenge with a lot of the big data technologies today, which is about being enterprise ready and enterprise grade. And this is another area where we're making 
uh, substantial investments, uh, and we think uh, those are pretty compelling. And so if we think about the Azure Data Lake, <coughs> the Azure Data Lake is the way to do big data in the cloud with Microsoft. It consists of three services. The first is the Azure Data Lake Store. This is a service that runs in the cloud that's designed to give you storage for any type of data that you want to do uh, analytics on top of. Uh, and our design point around this store has been don't surface limits to the customer that trip them up. Uh, a lot of times we find that uh, existing solutions have limits on the file size, limit on the account size, uh, limits on the way you can grant access, and that all of those force you to think about those limits as you're trying to solve your business problems. And to us, that's a problem because you should be focusing on your business problem, uh, you know, trying to optimize those wind farms, rather than worrying about, hey, my underlying storage technology uh, doesn't like it if the files get bigger than five terabytes. And so we built that uh, to be ready uh, for storing any size of data. Uh, we run a similar system inside the company that stores data in the exabyte scale. Uh, it's uh, gigabyte, terabyte, petabyte, exabyte. Um, then I think the next one is yottabyte. Um, but that's just a, an instance of how large this can scale. Uh, we support, you know, files that are larger than a petabyte, so you don't have to worry about partitioning your data. You can just keep putting data into uh, into the store. And then the real, the the exciting thing to me is that the APIs that we've surfaced on top of this aren't proprietary APIs that are exclusive to our cloud. It's HDFS, which is the Hadoop Distributed File System API. And so what this means is the entire ecosystem of things that can talk Hadoop, uh, to talk the Hadoop Distributed File System, can talk to the Data Lake Store. And so that means things like HD Insight, uh, if you're running Cloudera or Hortonworks inside of uh, Infrastructure as a Service, or if you're running that on-prem, you'll be able to access the data there. And we think that's really exciting. Uh, in order to be able to have this vision we have of, a data, of our data lake dream, which is you land all of your data in one place and then be able to spin up any type of processing that you want to do on top of that. So now let's talk a little bit about the processing services. Uh, there are two of them. The first one is one that's been around for a while, which is HD Insight. And HD Insight is our managed Hadoop service. And what we mean by that is we deploy, run, and manage Hadoop clusters so you don't have to. We're your ops team that wakes up at 3 in the morning if something breaks, uh, and we'll give you an SLA on your Hadoop cluster. And so HD Insight is for the customers that are looking at the wide array of technologies in the Hadoop space, like Hive and Pig and Spark and HBase and Storm, uh, and say, hey, those are the technologies I want to use. Uh, and then we focus on all the infrastructure stuff, so you don't have to. Uh, the other nice thing about all of these services is that they're fully supported by Microsoft. And what I mean by that is you can pick up the phone and call Microsoft and say, hey, Microsoft, my Hive query isn't working really well, uh, and our support teams are staffed around the clock, uh, around the globe, and we'll be able to engage with you and work to resolve that issue. The final service, and this is the, the new one that we announced uh, last Monday, is our analytics service. And the analytics service is the easiest way to get started with big data. And what that lets you do is just, you don't even have to worry about a cluster. You just walk up, you say, here is my job, here is my query, please run this. And then we take care of running that job. You only pay for the job when it's actually running. Uh, and so you can think about that as big data on demand. And there are some very interesting things that we've got in the analytics service, including a new language called uSQL. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit, I'll, I'll actually talk a lot more about that uh, in the next uh, portion of the talk. So those are the three key services inside of Azure Data Lake, the store, the analytics service, and HD Insight. 
Now, no ecosystem stands on its own. It has to be flushed out with a rich set of partners and ISVs that are building interesting applications. And so we partner with all of the leaders in the big data space, uh, ranging from the Hadoop vendors like Hortonworks, Cloudera, and MapR to the leading BI tools, Power BI. We partner with Tableau, uh, Zoom Data, Lumera, Click. Uh, and then we also partner with all of the leading ISVs in the big data space. And so these are companies like Datamir and Trifacta and Blue Talon, Waterline. These are all companies that make big data a lot more accessible to more people. Uh, and so Datamir, for instance, gives you an Excel-like interface for doing data cleansing and data preparation at any scale. Uh, you may be familiar with their, their tools uh, working with uh, SQL but they also work great with big data systems. And so this is the snapshot of our partners right now. This is growing every day. Um, and if there's an app that you don't see that is super useful for you in your day to day, uh, please reach out to us and tell us because we're using customer feedback to guide where are we going to invest next uh, and which partners are most important for us to onboard next. The, the final thing that I just want to say is uh, around the data lake is, you know, we're you running these same systems internally. Uh, HD Insight powers a ton of our internal services, as well as the Cosmos project, which I talked about earlier. Uh, and this, it's, it's not an exaggeration to say that Microsoft's business runs on top of these systems whether that's Office 365, Xbox, Azure, Windows, Bing, Skype, uh, every day within the company, we've got thousands and thousands of developers who are writing big data jobs using tools like uSQL and Hive and Pig and Spark. Uh, and this has given us a really great perspective on what is helpful for developers, what's useful for developers, uh, and what are a lot of the challenges that other companies are going to face as they start consuming and producing more and more data that they need to uh, derive meaning out of. And so what I'd like to do now is now we're going to uh, move over and for the next uh, 25 minutes or so, uh, we're going to focus on the different ways <coughs> that Data Lake makes you more productive. Uh, I've got a set of demos as well as I have screenshots on all the slides in case any of the internet connection gets a little flaky for me. Um, and this, these really cut across all the different pieces and parts of the spectrum. And so this starts with not having you worry about infrastructure. And so this will let you deploy your big data project within minutes. If you need 500 nodes of Hadoop, walk up to the Azure portal, type that in, and uh, you know, in about 20 minutes, we'll have a 500 node cluster available for you. Uh, you don't have to worry about, hey, what bits do I need to install? How do I configure these things? How do I tune this? How do I patch this? We take care of all of that for you. Uh, and the scale limit on this, uh, you know, we can go we, inside the company. We run jobs routinely uh, that run across tens of thousands of machines. Uh, and so you've got a nearly unlimited amount of scale that's available to you on demand. Uh, and so we really want to make it so you don't have to worry about those types of things. And so the way to show this, I'm going to go over to the Azure portal. And what this, this is the Azure management portal. This is a single pane of glass for all of uh, Azure. Uh, and so I will walk up to HD Insight, for instance, uh, and I will say, hey, I would like to add a new HD Insight cluster. And what this is going to do is pop up a screen that uh, it's going to ask me a few questions. What do you want to call this thing? What type of cluster would you like? Do you want Hadoop or HBase or Storm or Spark? Do you want to deploy it on Windows or Linux? Uh, we know customers have different preferences. Uh, and if you're running Hadoop today on-prem, you're probably running it on Linux. And so we want to make it easy for you to move to the cloud. And so 
Linux is a first class citizen in the HD Insight service. Uh, we announced general availability of the Linux offering last week. Uh, and what this means is you can choose what is going to work best for you, whether that's Windows or Linux. Uh, we specify how big of a cluster uh, we'd like to have. So let me just call this uh, mwinkle demo5. Uh, I will say that I'd like a storm cluster. I'd like to deploy that. Oops. Uh, I would like a storm cluster. I would like to deploy that on Linux. Uh, and then what I would like to be able to do is pick how large of a cluster I want. Uh, and so I can go ahead uh, and deploy. You know, it's not quite as easy as a slider, but I can say, hey, I'd like, uh, can I say 100 nodes? I think this subscription might be a little bit limited. We can say 50 nodes. 10 nodes. Uh, and I can go ahead and customize, hey, what are the types of nodes that I want? Uh, if I need a lot of RAM, I can, I can take care of all of that configuration if I want, or you can just click go and we'll take care of that for you. And then I click create, and then in about 10 to 15 minutes, we'll be up and running uh, with that applicate with with a, a storm cluster. So now that's the that's with HD Insight. Uh, with the analytics service, it's exactly the same way. So if I go and look at the Data Lake analytics service, uh, you'll see I've got an account that's already been created. It takes about uh, 30 seconds to create an account. You answer three questions and click go. And all I have to do here is say, hey, I'd like to run a new job. And this is going to bring up a, uh, a, an authoring environment that I can use in the browser to go ahead and write my query and submit it. And so this is where we want to make it super easy for you to get up and running and not really worry about deployment or, uh, or tweaking uh, config settings or anything about that. And that gets to our next point, which is around reliability, uh, which is, you know, we're running this service for you. We've got an SLA on this service, which means if we don't keep your Hadoop cluster, for instance, in the HD Insight case, uh, available 99.9% .9 of the time, we'll give you your money back. You don't have to worry about hiring someone to figure out how to upgrade and patch Hadoop. Uh, and the other thing here is that we've got a set of rich tools in Azure that help you move from development to production because we know a lot of these big data jobs uh, it's really easy to write the first job and it's pretty easy to write the second job but then you have a problem because the second job can only run after the first job has completed successfully so now you have a, a, a workflow problem of how do you orchestrate these things and you know we see this all the time with customers who you know, they have very elaborate workflows where they're processing slices of the data because every hour they want to update a bunch of statistics. And what happens if uh, the data for that one slice hasn't arrived in time? All of these things are kind of hard to figure out. And so we've got a tool called the Azure Data Factory, which allows you to orchestrate all of your data movement uh, challenges. And so let me just go ahead and show what that looks like. Uh, that's this slide here, which is really about uh, taking data that's landing in the cloud, being able to run jobs on top of it, and then specify outputs. And so this is, this is an easy way to get started to say, hey, I need to refine this data and then load it into uh, Azure SQL Data Warehouse. The other thing that I'd like to show here uh, is around uh, security and administration. Uh, so we're, all of the data lake services are integrated with Azure Active Directory. And so what I'm showing you here in this slide is uh, an Azure data lake analytics account uh, that I've walked up to. Uh, this is actually an Azure data lake uh, store account. And I want to add someone from the Microsoft address book to be able to have access to the files. And I can say, does he have read access or write access to those files? And so because we've federated... Uh, our on-prem Active Directory with Azure Active Directory here at Microsoft, I can simply walk up and type in, uh, this is my boss, I can type in his email address and say, I want to add him to this Azure Data Lake store. 
And so this makes it really easy from a security and governance perspective to be able to add users and not have to worry about uh, a lot of the challenges with uh, uh, authentication and authorization in these systems. One thing, uh, this is a little bit more of a marketing slide, but I, I like to point it out, uh, is around, you know, we, we see customers saving money with big data deployments in particular when they're running in the cloud. And this really boils down to the cloud really lets you only pay for what you need when you need it. Uh, and so uh, this is in contrast to on-prem where, you know, you either have to buy hardware licenses, you have to, you know, buy, you have to provision for peak utilization on-prem. Uh, you may need, uh, you know, uh, a service agreement that's priced on a per node basis. Uh, you know, what we're do enabling you to do in the cloud is take advantage and only pay for that when you use it. And so we have a lot of customers that will run uh, clusters in HD Insight uh, for, you know, at 10 nodes for most of the week because they've got some data scientists that want to run some ad hoc queries throughout the week. Uh, and then every night when they want to do their uh, roll up on all of the data that was gathered during the day, they can scale that cluster up to 100 nodes run it for two hours on all of the jobs, that, on all of the data that they've got, uh, and then they can shrink that back down to 10. Uh, and so this really allows you to be in control of your costs. Um, and then the other thing, because this is all managed and supported for you, you know, you don't need to hire a, a big data ops team to run your big data infrastructure. We're going to take care of that for you. The next thing I'd like to talk about is, uh, we, we talked about this a little bit when we were talking about the store, but we really want developers and analysts, uh, data engineers, you know, DBAs, to really focus on the, the insight that they're trying to get out of the system. Uh, you know, focus on writing the interesting query that helps you understand your customer behavior, not on limits around oh wait, I could only do that up to 200 gigabytes of data and then I need to switch to this other system or I need to put these weird partitions in the data. Uh, we don't want you to have to think about those things. Uh, we really don't want you to have to re rewrite your code or re-architect your solution as you increase the size of data being stored. Uh, and so this is a design principle that shows up throughout the, pr the, the products uh, and this really makes you more productive. Uh, and what I like to uh, show there is I have an account somewhere that's got a 20 terabyte file. Uh, and so that's, that's just something where I can now write jobs against that. And I don't have to worry about um, really focus on, hey, how do I need to partition that? The next thing is around being able to use tools that you want. Uh, and so this is... Uh, this is something that we think is really important, um, which is not everyone's going to use the Microsoft tool for something. And so if you want to be able to use Hue, uh, which is a pretty popular uh, application for writing big data jobs, we allow you to easily install that. We've got a sample you can click and it'll just deploy that for you. Uh, if you want to install a different tool, uh, so we have some customers that uh, really are interested in Apache Drill. Uh, which is a, a open source SQL on Hadoop project that's uh, based on the Google paper uh, for Dremel. Uh, it's not something we support in the service, but if customers want to be able to still bring that tool and use that against all of the data that they're collecting, they can do that. The other thing that we've got inside of uh, our Spark clusters, and this is something that's pretty cool for folks to check out. I don't know if folks have seen these uh, notebooks, uh, which are either Jupyter or IPython or Zeppelin are kind of the three big ones. Uh, and what these provide are a web hosted uh, way for you to just interact and party on your data. Uh, and you can do that writing raw SQL queries. They support visual, rich visualization out of the box. Uh, you can also write Python or uh, Spark jobs, uh, if you want to manipulate your data that way. 
Um, and this is where we see a lot of the data scientist community. These are the types of tools we see them using. And so the the other thing that we're doing around productivity is integrating our big, all of our big data tools with Visual Studio. Um, and we really want to do this because we know it's hard to get started writing jobs, and we know it's hard to tune those jobs on, you know, when I, when I scale up and I run into a performance issue. And so the same tools that we use internally for those jobs that run across tens of thousands of nodes, uh, we're shipping those into Visual Studio to let you be able to author and debug your jobs. And so what I want to do here is I actually want to skip ahead to uh, USQL. Uh, this, this being a, a SQL community call, uh, I think this is probably something that's very interesting to folks. Um, USQL is uh, an evolution of the SQL we're all familiar with that we've designed to specifically address a number of the issues that we see with big data. Our goal and what we've seen uh, internally, this grew out of a project that we call Scope, um, is that for a lot of big data jobs, most of what you're doing feels very SQL-like. That is, you can be very productive thinking about the problem from a relational algebra perspective. Uh, I want to be able to select this data, I want to project it this way, group by uh, having these, uh, you know, using having to sit, take the aggregate functions that I'm using and apply filters at that aggregate level. And so SQL was our starting point for USQL. Uh, the second thing that we know is that uh, oftentimes, in, particularly with these big data jobs, it's not just one query that you're writing. You're actually evolving uh, across a series of jobs or queries uh, in more of a pipeline. And so the second thing, kind of the next thing that we've done uh, starting with SQL is we've added this syntax, uh, which to me is, if you're familiar with uh, Apache Pig, it's similar to that, uh, which allows you to construct these data flows. And so if you look at the small code sample over on the left, you'll see I'm assigning the results of a query to res, uh, and then I can use res later in the query. What that allows us to do is behind the scenes build up a big graph of all of the stuff that's happening in that job and do our optimizations globally across that entire graph of all of the various steps. The final thing that we've seen is that particularly with big data jobs where you're dealing with data that's shaped funny or isn't quite perfect, uh, or has all sorts of convoluted rules and business logic that you need to deal with when you're processing the data, is that a lot of the extensibility mechanisms for traditional SQL tools, they're very powerful, but they're very hard to use. Uh, so authoring your own uh, user-defined functions is pretty challenging from a concept count perspective, as well as kind of the development life cycle. And so, you know, we would see a lot of folks who simply wanted to drop into a set of C-sharp string functions that they didn't have in the SQL language. And so the final thing that we're doing with USQL is we're bringing together, we're bringing in the power of, uh, an, of imperative code alongside the SQL code. And so this allows you to pretty rapidly run these jobs, author these jobs, and then we can optimize those and run those at scale. And we'll parallelize your, your c sharp code right alongside the relational operators. The other thing uh, that we know is oftentimes you want to be able to run these types of jobs across different queries, uh, different data sources. And so we've invested a lot in distributed query support. Uh, and what this allows you to do is you can query data that sits in the data lake. You can query data that sits in Azure Blob Store. You can query data that sits inside of SQL Server or SQL DW or SQL databases. Um, and we really think that this, in particularly for big data workflows, makes you more productive because you don't have to first say, oh, there's this really interesting data set, but it's in the database. 
So I've got to export that to CSV and then move that into my Hadoop system and then I can write my job on top of that. Um, and so this is why we've built uSQL. This is something we're really excited about. I'll dive into a couple more examples uh, of uSQL on the next couple of slides. Uh, and you know the thing that we're looking to do here is we've heard from a lot of folks. Uh, you know the the big data team sits inside of the SQL team here at Microsoft, and so we're very often talking with SQL customers as well as existing big data customers. And one of the things that we've heard both from SQL developers as well as .NET developers is, hey, I don't really know what my path forward here for this big data thing is. Uh, I, I tried this Hadoop stuff and I tried this Hive thing uh, and I wrote a query that I thought made sense and then I got this massive Java exception stack. Um, we really want to provide a super easy way for our folks, our customers today that are writing you know, T-SQL jobs that are .NET developers. We want to give them a nice path forward into the world of big data. And so uh, three code examples that I'll show here. Uh, this first one is I'm uh, working on uh, a set of tweets. And so this is sitting in a comma delimited file. Uh, what you'll see in this first stanza here where I'm assigning to T is this is the syntax for applying schema to unstructured data. So I have this file which is my Twitter history. I'm going to read it using the CSV extractor. Extractors are extensible. You can write one for your own format. We'll have a library of them for JSON and XML and uh, you know various text formats and binary formats. Uh, and so I'm going to apply this uh, schema on top of it. I'm going to use .NET types. So this is one thing that's a little different than SQL. But I'll show you why this is kind of interesting. Uh, here I'm going to do a projection, and you'll see on this, oh, sorry, on this string type for tweet, I'm actually dropping into the .NET framework, uh, and I'm able to write, hey, I'm going to split this uh, based on, I'm going to split it into words, uh, and then I want to filter it so that I only grab the words that start with the at sign. So for uh, folks who know Twitter, what I'm doing here is I'm extracting out all of the mentions. And then I'm going to walk down and I'm going to query that again. Uh, I'm going to uh, apply a split. Uh, I'm going to cross apply on this, which allows me to perform the operations across each of the values that were returned in this array. Uh, and then I'm going to group this uh, and write the output. And so what you see here is this is kind of the, the sample which shows this is why integrating with the .NET code is interesting. Um, because for a lot of folks that we talk about, while you can certainly do all of this uh, in T-SQL uh, or in kind of the, the standard SQL operators, sometimes there's a lot more flexibility uh, and expressiveness that you get with c -sharp. The next thing that I want to show here is here I'm doing, uh, this is a job I wrote, um, so any uh, syntax uh, complaints, feel free to file them directly against me. Uh, and what I'm doing here is I'm actually running on all of our service telemetry uh, because I wanted to understand what are the latencies that our customers are seeing. And the thing that I really want to show here is if you look at this summary stanza where I'm selecting the distinct business week, I'm using the same analytic operators that you'd expect and that, that come straight from SQL. And so what we've actually been able to do with uSQL is oftentimes we can cut and paste uh, Hive queries or uh, T-SQL queries, and there's a couple of things that we need to clean up, uh, but for the most part, those work. Uh, and so, you know, what I'm trying to show here is we've invested a lot to have the familiarness of SQL here, and then we'll let you drop into things like here I have, uh, I'm sorry for the really long namespace here, but uh, here's a, a, a helper function that we've deployed which uh, computes the uh, business week for us. Um, because uh, for our internal reporting purposes, a business week starts uh, at the end of Friday UTC time. Um, 
or the very beginning of Saturday UTC time. And so that's kind of just something everybody has to put into their queries, and so we've published a UDF that will take any date and let you uh, uh, operate on that. The final thing that I want to show here is the distributed query support. Uh, and so here I'm querying out to an Azure SQL data warehouse. Um, and what this looks like in terms of the query, here's the data source registration up at the top. Uh, we can ignore that for right now. Uh, is I'm selecting count uh, from external SQL, uh, mwinkle SQL DW on this database and table. Uh, and what's cool about this is uh, in our distributed query engine, we're aware of the capabilities of the, the sources that we're going to be querying. And so I actually will push this entire query down as T-SQL into SQL Data Warehouse. And what that means is I don't have to pull in all billion rows that are sitting in this sales order detail table. Uh, I'm going to push a query in, and the only thing that's going to return in this case is a single value. Uh, and so this gives me a lot of uh, power to be able to say, hey, I want to be able to integrate with these existing systems. Um, we can push a lot of queries down. Uh, you can also explicitly say, here's a chunk of T-SQL that I want to have executed, and then I'll just operate on that row set that comes back. Uh, so we do give you kind of the full control to say, hey, uh, I'm going to take my existing T-SQL, plop it in here against my existing data source, uh, and then just party on that output. Okay, a little bit of a demo uh, in the two minutes that I've got left. Uh, so these tools are installed inside of Visual Studio. What I want to show here is, uh, let me find where I put that query. So this is that same query uh, that I uh, showed earlier. Uh, which is running against uh, our telemetry data. I'm going to submit that. Uh, this is going to turn around and submit the job. And then what we've got is a job browser. And so what you're actually seeing here is this is pulling up the, uh, I'll come back to that in just a second. But here's the job browser that lets me see all of the jobs that are executing against my Azure Data Lake Analytics account. Uh, and it gives me, so this is an earlier run of this job, uh, and what it allows me to do is visualize the operator graph. Uh, let me zoom in here. And this allows me to see, hey, I partied on uh, one gigabyte of data, um, and what did I do at the various stages? Now, the interesting thing we can do here is I can actually do something called job playback. And what this allows me to do is, in 30 seconds, playback the entire job. And so what this allows me to do is see, hey, where am I bottlenecking? What's going on in my job? And this is displaying progress right now, so you'll see it's kind of hanging there a little bit. I can also overlay different things, like how much data was read at the various stages? How much uh, execution time was spent in the various stages? And what this can allow me to do is see, hey, were there any bottlenecks? Is there skew in my data? Is there something else I can do in order to make this run faster? And then the final thing that's really powerful about this is, you know, when I submit this job, I say, hey, use up to 50 degrees of parallelism. Um, and that's also going to be what you pay for. And so what this allows me to do is I can actually run diagnostics on the job to understand, hey, uh, let me go to the, the modeler here. You actually, you didn't need to allocate, in this case, I allocated 25 degrees of parallelism. Uh, what this is saying is, hey, your best execution time is going to occur with only five. Uh, and so this allows me to understand my resource consumption and say, uh, hey, this is enough. Um, I actually over-allocated for this job, and this allows me to fine-tune how much I'm spending and also not, not waste, uh, not waste uh, extra resources. Let me just go back to that job that I submitted, and what you'll actually see here is, in real time, this job is, this job graph is updating. And so this lets me see, hey, where am I at for my job prog progress? And let me understand the, the state that I'm in. And so with that, um, what I'll do now is uh, pop back to the control panel uh, and turn it over for uh, questions for the next 10 minutes. 
And so if you've got questions, you can go ahead and put them in the tool. Thank you very much, just, Matt. Right. Uh, yeah, um, so that was a great presentation. Thank you very much for presenting. So right now you have a question window. Um, so please, if you have any questions, write them in the window and I will read them for Matt. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so we got the first one. Is the job graph for Hadoop available in Visual Studio now? Yes, it is. Uh, if you install the latest version of the Azure SDK, this is kind of fun. Um, hold on, let me hide that screen. Um, I can go, this is a Hive job um, that ran on the system, that ran on HD Insight, uh, and I get the same job graph for Hive jobs that are running on, on Tez. Um, and you can access that if you go into Server Explorer, uh, under HD Insight, so let me just scroll up here, and I have a lot of, I'm on a number of shared subscriptions, so I have a lot of clusters, uh, and just say, hey, write, write Hive query. The other thing that's cool about this is this should work against uh, on-prem uh, Hadoop clusters as well. I know we've tested it against Hortonworks, but you can just right-click on the HD Insight node and say connect to a Hadoop cluster. You have to pass in a couple of uh, configuration options that your Hadoop admin can tell you about. Uh, and this will allow you to submit uh, Hive jobs and be able to get this same uh, graph information uh, off of it as well. Thank you. Um, another question is, can you pull or push to Mongo? Can we pull or push to Mongo? Uh, so there's nothing in the system that prevents us from doing that, uh, and over time we'll be expanding the set of uh, distributed query sources as well as destinations. It's not there right now. Right now our focus was largely on uh, getting a relational uh, engine, uh, namely SQL, there. But this is one of those things, once we get in private preview, or once we get in public preview, uh, and folks start playing around with it, this is the type of feedback, you know, what are the most important data sources we should prioritize? Uh, you know, would love to, whoever asked that question, please feel free to reach out to me. I'd love to talk to you some more about the use cases that you'd envision with Mongo so that we can understand that a little bit better. Thank you. Um, so how different is USQL from SQL? I've been preparing for R and Python, not SQL. I know Polybase had an MPP, Massive Parallel Processing Type SQL, is this the same thing? So, a couple of questions there. Um, so, what about R and Python? Um, so, we see a lot of our customers using both R and Python, uh, and I think thinking about integrating USQL with those in addition to C-sharp is very, very interesting. Um, USQL is not, is not a replacement for R or Python. Uh, we think that USQL is unique in that uh, it lets you stay within kind of the familiarity of SQL, uh, but still get a lot of the expressiveness that user code can bring you uh, in a much easier way than a lot of uh, a lot of the current SQL on big data offerings do. Um, for folks who are familiar with Python, who want to use Python for data wrangling, or use R for uh, uh, predictive analytics or statistics, we think that's that's a great starting place as well. Um, we think the sweet spot for USQL is really folks who are coming from, who are most comfortable with a SQL background um, and kind of starting from there and moving forward. But, you know, the, the one thing about the big data space is there is no one tool that fits them all, uh, that fits every problem. Uh, our developers inside of Microsoft have been incredibly productive with the mixed style of SQL and C Sharp that uh, USQL provides, and so and we don't see that currently as uh, something that's being addressed in the big data space. So that's that's why we did that. Um, the final part of that question was about hey, what about what about Polybase uh, inside? Uh, PDW or APS or uh, SQL DW. Um, the way I think about Polybase is that Polybase lets you 
stay within T-SQL uh, and reach out to those other data sources. And so uh, it's it's great if you've got uh, you know a set of a T-SQL query that you're writing and you want to be able to seamlessly include data that's sitting inside of HDFS, for instance. Um, what we think of it, we think Polybase and our distributed query technology, they're, they're built by a lot of the same folks. Um, we think they're very complementary uh, in that the distributed query technology that we have really is for if I'm starting from the space of I have a big data problem and so USQL fits my problem space better than traditional SQL, uh, then we also want to have that ability to do uh, distributed or federated query. And feel free, if that answer wasn't uh, uh, good enough for you or if there's other questions about my answer there, please feel free to shoot me an email. I'll be happy to, to, to talk to you about it. Thank you. Um, so two questions in one. How to, pra to practice this demo? How to get started with this? Sure. So if you go to uh, azure.com slash data lake with a dash between data and lake, um, I'll go do it right now. So azure.com whack data lake. And I may have, may have not put the dash in there. Uh, but if you go there, that has all the information. We uh, we are doing a, a sign up for our uh, oh yeah Azure.com data lake should work. Um, we are doing a sign up for our uh, service so for the public preview. Um, so if you want to get started with this, you can get started today with HD Insight, which is uh, for deploying managed Hadoop, Spark, Storm clusters. Uh, and if you want to get notified when we move into public preview on uh, the analytics service in the store, sign up there. Uh, we're working very, very hard to make that available as soon as we can. Great. Um, another question similar. Are the SQL scripts and tools shown in this session will be available for download? If they are, from where to download? So I guess it's the same answer. Yeah, it's the same answer. These will all be part of our sample jobs uh, and sample gallery that we'll have uh, when we move into public preview. Uh, if anybody is super excited about getting it, them sooner just to see what uSQL looks like, please feel free again, shoot me an email, uh, and I'll be happy to, to send them to you. Um, David says, uh, this is most excellent. Thank you. Yeah, I also believe it was a great presentation. Um, thank you very much, Matt, for coming and presenting at our Big Data Virtual Chapter. Um, you will have this session available at our YouTube channel and stay tuned because we will announce in our next session within the next days. So thank you very much, everyone, for coming. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.